with me forever. And if you take off, if you, if you decide to, to go off in another direction or, or become polytheist or, or do any of these things, and, and you're, you're, you're doing this in the land, you're committing injustice, you're disobeying the law that you agreed to keep, I'm going to bring you back, and I'm going to bring you back by sort of taking my hands off you from protection. I'm going to take my protection away from you. These other people that are all around you, these other groups that, uh, that, I, that I protect you from, they're going to come in, and they're going to do all kinds of bad things to you. Yeah. And then you're going to call out to me, and you're going to return to me, and you're going to say, why did we ever, why did we ever uh, leave you? So think about this. Even in this case, even in this case, uh, the purpose of God allowing these groups to come in and punish the Israelites is for their good. It's to bring them back to God. In Islam, the purpose of, of killing the unbelievers is either to bring them to Islam, but the unbelievers who refuse to come to Islam, it's just getting rid of them, and then they go and burn in hell. It's not for their good. Exactly. Uh oh, okay. And I just have one other quick comment. Yes, By the way, before point. we go on, did you understood our point, right, what we're saying? I did. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, it's sometimes like it's difficult to understand, and I need somebody else to interpret for me. So. By the way, before you, even, before you begin, let me read just some verses from Leviticus 26 to prove what David said. Let me just look at okay. Leviticus 26, 21 to 23 to see and why... Wait, what by, are you referring to the old, um, um, the New American Bible? or it, it, You can read any American. translation. NIV, NASB, ESV, we read them all, as long oh. as they accurately translate the original languages in English. I'm reading the SV, but you can read the NIV. But let me just oh. read 21 to 23 to see why God is punishing them. Because he's loved them, blessed them, protected them, but they keep rejecting him and continue to do evil. Now let's see the intention to confirm what David said. The scripture confirmed what he just said because he was simply uh, quote, uh, alluding to the scripture. Leviticus 26, 21 to 23. Then if you walk contrary to me, notice, if you walk contrary to me, you don't do what I tell you. And will not listen to me, I will continue striking you sevenfold for your sins. And I will let loose the wild beast against you, see, taking his hand away, which shall bereave you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, so that your roads shall be distorted. Now, 23, notice this. And if by this discipline you are not turned to me, but walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you. So did you notice it? I am disciplining yes. you to get your attention to repent. But if that doesn't happen, I'm going to have to punish you because you're turning against me. So this is not torture or plotting. This is a God who has proven himself faithful in his love for them, disciplining them because they don't reciprocate. So this is comparing apples and oranges. And, and, and again, this is, God is not saying this to, uh, to unbelievers. This is not the message of the Jews to unbelievers. If you do not submit to Judaism, uh, you are going to be either, either we are going to face you with all this violence or God is going to bring uh, all of this upon you. This is, a, this is a message for people who say, I am entering into this covenant with God. This was their choice. Th right. Their choice is to enter into this agreement with God. And this is all part of the agreement. It's we understand here at the beginning that by entering into this agreement with you, God, if we decide uh, a little later on, hey, we're going to ignore you based on what, because God is keeping his end of the bargain. God's saying, all right, uh, if, you, if you decide to enter this covenant, I'm going to do this for you. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to bring you into this land. Um, but once I do that, if you decide to, to not keep your end of the bargain, I'm going to make you keep your end of the bargain. Yeah. Uh, this is very different from Islam, exactly. which is a message to unbelievers. If you do not do what we say you must do, these are not people who have entered into a covenant. These are not people who have agreed to this. These are people who, who are outside the fold of Islam, who do not agree with Islam. Uh, Islam's message to them is, all of you, we're going to come and we're going to fight and we're going to conquer all of you and ultimately kill uh, kill you, rape your women, do whatever we want, exactly. uh, because you're not agreeing with us. So very, very different situations here. And there is no command in the Old Testament saying that you take a captive and rape her. And the Old Testament says, when you fight enemies who come against you and you find a captive that's beautiful, let me give you the reference. Deuteronomy 21, verses 10 to 14. Deuteronomy 21, sorry, 10 to 14. Again? It's Deuteronomy 21, verses okay. 10 to 14. When Israel goes to war with nations who are going to war with them, God says, when you see a captive that's beautiful, you give her one month to mourn her dead, then you marry her. He doesn't say rape her, even if she's still married, and then sell her off. That's the Quran. That's in Surah the Nisa, chapter 4, verse 24. There it says that Muslims can even have sex with captive women who are still married. The Bible says, no, if you find a captive... You allow her to mourn for her debt, and then you marry her, take her as a wife. And then it says, if you find something displeasing in her, 
When you divorce her, send her off, give her freedom. You cannot sell her as a slave. That's Deuteronomy 21, 10 to 14. So when you're comparing the Quran with the Old Testament, it's comparing apples and oranges. But go to your next point if you well, have, oh, do we have to take a break. Yeah, this is what we'll have to do. We have to uh, take Jana, a break. We, Don't we leave. Have, we have to take a break. Stay on uh, hold with us. We have about 20 minutes left on the show. So for those of you trying to get through to the show and you can't, make sure that you stay tuned tonight at 1030 with Pastor Joseph, Sam, and David. Again, tonight's topic, Scripture Twisting 101, Part 2. We'll take a break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. We have Janelle on air with us. Janelle, what were your final uh, questions or comments for yes, us tonight? Yes, my, my final question is that I have a question about the Fort Hood massacre. I actually yes. asked my friend that's Muslim about it, and she told me that the extremists in Islam are not recognized by God and that Islam condone, does not you know, condone it at all. They actually condemn it. And she told me that, like, towards like the end of the world that there's going to be a lot of extremists in Islam that do bad things that but they um you know don't go to heaven and they're not recognized by God whatsoever or by the religion itself like they're not you know called like they don't see them as muslims they just see them as bad people like as extremists so what is your comment on that when she tells me that they don't even like to them they don't even like exist as muslims well uh, uh that, that certainly is a position that, that Muslims are uh, using here in the United States. And, uh, you know, for all I know, your friend may be telling you what she actually believes. Uh, but is that what Islam teaches? And the, the answer is absolutely no. Um, if, if you go to uh, my blog, AnsweringMuslims.com, if you can visit that, AnsweringMuslims.com, I have there uh, a video we made yesterday where we actually went through uh, the PowerPoint presentation of Major Hassan. Uh, so he, uh, he's the one who, who shot up his, his fellow soldiers at Fort Hood. We went through his PowerPoint presentation where he uses uh, the Quran and the Hadith to justify what he did, and he is absolutely correct. Uh, if Muslims want to say that people who use violence uh, against others are extremists, well, they've just identified Muhammad as an extremist. They've just I identified all four of the rightly guided caliphs as extremists. They've identified all of Muhammad's original companions as extremists because they all used violence. They all used the sword. They all fought against unbelievers. They all did this. Muhammad himself, Muhammad himself said that if you go to stand before God, this is, this is Muhammad talking, if you go to stand before Allah on Judgment Day and you do not have wounds on your body, scars from fighting against the unbelievers, you are deficient. You're not a good Muslim. He says that if you die without either fighting or if you're, if you're, if you're not able to fight, for instance, you become a, a Muslim when you're 95 years old, without either fighting or wishing you could have fought, you die on one of the branches of hypocrisy. According to Muhammad himself, if you die not either, without either fighting the unbelievers or wanting to fight them, you are a hypocrite. This is how central fighting is. In Islam, and I will just read this, I will just read this passage, we, we talk about it on practically every program, but think about what this is saying. This is Surah 929. Uh, get a Quran, learn this, memorize it, it's very important. Fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day. This does not say, fight the people who are oppressing you. This does not say, fight in self-defense if someone invades your country. This says, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and His Messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of books. So who are the people who do not follow the religion of